I didn't want to leave Michael. He didn't want me to leave. And it was within that, within that first week that the, that the sexual abuse began. If anybody else, you know, ever found out about anything that we're doing here, um, both of our lives would be over. When he would disappear with another boy, you know, I had a sense of what was going on in there. I ended up being pretty like promiscuous, sexually promiscuous with, with women. You know, in hindsight, it, it feels to me like I was with that fear and that confusion, like almost really trying to prove something to myself. Standing in a circle of doubt, trying to get out. I fall upon my face in disgrace, and I'm running down a hall of pain. At least I'm out of the rain, pouring rain. again Oh, can I afford to cry I paid the price for every life And I for an eye Oh, I, I Oh, I Hello, I'm Craig Hiding, and I'd like to welcome you all to the program uh, discussion focused on male survivors of childhood sexual abuse, sponsored by the Men of Voices Beyond Assault. My co-host, Lorward, is unable to join us live today, but is here in spirit behind the scenes. As most of us here today, Lorward and I are also survivors. Voices Beyond Assault recently started a men's division because we understand that Men's voices are not always heard, and we want to amplify their voices, empower them to heal, and provide the resources that are needed. And with that, let me introduce you to our special guest today, Wade Robson. Wade Robson, several years ago, took the courageous step to come forward and expose his sexual abuse by pop singer Michael Jackson, beginning when he was just seven years old. Wade's story was chronicled along with survivor James Safechuck in the HBO documentary, Leaving Neverland. Wade and James also host a podcast called From Trauma to Triumph, providing valuable resources to help survivors move through their own healing journeys. And Wade, thank you so much. I know it's very early where you are in, in Hawaii. But, you know, since you are in Hawaii, none of us are going to really feel sorry for you. But <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's really a pleasure. I, I, I think I told you this a, a while ago, but when we talked, but uh, when I first uh, decided to break my silence or, or needed to break my silence, as most of us do, um, the uh, your story and you're coming forward and seeing Neverland, leaving Neverland and seeing the Oprah interview afterwards were just so inspirational to me mm -hmm. and uh, let me know that I wasn't alone and, and really provided so much strength uh, for me in my own healing journey. And I just want to give you my heartfelt appreciation for that. It's a it's it's amazing um, what you've done, and the podcast is amazing. I listen to every single one of them, uh, sometimes more than once, because uh, there's so much information to them. So, so let's get into it and 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 talk about first uh, about how it all began. You first met Michael Jackson when you were just five years old. Do you remember that moment? Uh, yeah. Let me just first say. Thank you, Craig, for for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, with you and with everybody here. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yes. So your question was, do I remember that moment? Yeah. First meeting Michael. Uh, five. <laughs> yes, I do. You know, sometimes it becomes confusing because there's pictures and there's video of it. So sometimes that gets 
we don't know what is you know a hundred percent memory of, of my own or also what i've reseen through photos and video but um yes i do um you know he i was first introduced to michael at all uh, when i was two um meaning just the idea of him um seeing you know his thriller music video and um you know just immediately became obsessed with him and uh with it and the way he moved and all of that um so you know by the time i was five he was um he was a mystical figure to me um and he was my idol he was like a god to me and so yeah there was this dance competition that had come into town and uh, that michael's company was organizing and they were doing in each you know country that he was touring into and it was a dance alike contest you know dance like him and um i ended up going in it at five and ended up winning it and the prize was to meet michael um uh, sort of my wildest dream this little boy in australia you know uh coming true um so yeah the uh the first time meeting him was um after one of his concerts in australia in brisbane australia and there was like a meet and greet sort of thing uh with i don't know several people um myself and my mother and father were there and um yeah then you know all of a sudden there he was in the flesh this kind of being who was this sort of mystical figure to me and um we met and i was wearing my sort of little homemade you know michael jackson bad outfit um and he kept commenting on that and then asked me to perform with him asked if i danced i said yeah asked me to perform with him in the show the next night or so and um yeah it was an otherworldly wow so experience. you came out and at five years old you came out on stage with uh with michael jackson wow yeah. and uh, you know we should mention that you're an award-winning choreography choreographer yourself uh so you think you can dance and and, mm -hmm. and lots of other things that you've been involved in britney spears and tours yeah. for for people and things like that so did, did he influence your chore you know your decision to be a choreographer or was that always in your bread i mean absolutely you know maybe indirectly but directly in the sense that you know michael was my introduction to dance and to art really um so you know anything that i engaged up in uh, engaged in artistically post that was always at least some degree influenced and inspired by his creative work um so yeah you know he was my he was my dance my original dance idol so absolutely you know his influence played a role so in me, I'm looking you know, back like can you think about and, and I know it's hard to think about when you were that young, but can you pinpoint any items that that were evidence of his starting to groom you? Um, you know, in the more explicit sense, it would probably be. So there was that first meeting when we were five, when I was five, and then you know, so I met him in the meet and greet. I performed with him on stage. And then my mother and I spent a couple of hours with him um, in his hotel room in Australia within that first, you know, week or so. Um, and then that was it as far as contact with him for a couple of years. Uh, and then we met again when I was seven. And that's when the, you know, relationship really sort of started. Um, so within that first trip so when we met again when i was seven um we met at a recording studio and then that night myself he invited myself and my family to neverland to his home um and we went to go stay for the weekend um so over that first weekend um you know when i look back now you know, he became physically he started to become physically intimate with me pretty quickly in ways that seemed you know innocuous at first um with just 
you know, holding hands, um, hugging, you know, hand on my thigh when we'd be driving in a car, just, you know, what, what felt like at the time, a real sort of, uh, paternal, um, physical intimacy, you know, um, kisses on the cheek when hugging things like that. Um, so that's kind of, that's what seemed like sweet physical intimacy started to become normalized really quickly, like within the first 24 hours of really starting to be together when I was seven, you know? So it didn't feel uh, inappropriate because you didn't really know what inappropriate was that age. No. And, and honestly, it, because of who he was to me, as I've been saying, this idol and this mystical figure who I was just so obsessed with, it felt incredible. You know, he's, it felt like, wow, he's like, he really likes me and he's treating me like, a father and he wants to hold my hand like like my father would or my mother would and he wants to hug me like my mother would um so it made at the time you know it made me feel really comfortable it made me feel really special you know and, and your parents didn't notice this and think it was inappropriate or your mother or... not not that i know of you know yeah i mean um, so oh, go ahead, i mean to, to 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 speak to that i mean you know they, my mother and father, and, and my sister who was with us, uh, and my grandparents who were also with us um, on that first trip to Neverland, you know, they were also all caught up in his, uh, his mysticism and his fame and his celebrity and his sort of, you know, extremely, in those interactions, extremely gentle, sweet nature um and playful and childlike um so you know all of us including my parents were just kind of intoxicated by that i believe you know yeah that's it's very interesting so a lot of times when we hear about uh, children being abused we hear that um the grooming isn't just for the the child it's mm -hmm. also the family around them um did do you, do you, did you, can you pinpoint evidence of that? I mean, did he make an effort to groom the rest of your family? Yeah, I think so. Um, he, you know, he really gave all of them special attention as well. Uh, particularly my mother, um, maybe a little less so my father, uh, in the beginning that definitely became evident as time went on, meaning less that he, he really was successful in at least exacerbating a sort of separation of my father, you know? Um, but I think in that first weekend, um, it was sort of global, his, his attention and, and, and uh, connection, effort to make connection with, with my whole family. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and then, um, and then the abuse started and um, we won't go into the details. People can watch Leaving Neverland if they want to get the, 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 um, the major details of that, but you were, he was a huge star and um, you know, you were, but, but he had normalized this at the point. So had it been normalized to the point that when the actual physical abuse started, you still felt that that was normal as well? Yeah, so uh, just to briefly give some context of time, as I was just talking about that first weekend, we went with the whole family. Um, and then that was supposed to be it for the for the trip and the whole family was supposed to leave um you know the next monday or whatever after that to go on and keep traveling through the states um i didn't want to leave michael he didn't want me to leave um so we kind of both asked i mean i think i asked first if i could like to my parents if i could stay and michael supported that um and my parents said okay so my parents and grandparents and my sister left Neverland and went on like a Grand Canyon trip. And I stayed alone with Michael for the next, I believe it was five days, somewhere around a week. Um, so now, you know, after that sort of initial weekend set up with the family, it was just 
me and him in, you know, what was it? Almost 3000 acres of sort of, you know, Michael Jackson country. Um, and it was within that, within that first week that the, that the sexual abuse began. Oh, so right away. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so your question was, did I, did it feel like it was normal already? Um, it definitely, that's a hard one to answer. Um, I wasn't, you know, it definitely wasn't that I was expecting it. Right. Um, you know, I had no concept of anything like that happening between anybody, let alone me and him. Um, but, you know, continuing like his approach was, you know, it was never scary. It was never frightening. Uh, it was very gentle, very loving. And I didn't, th you know, I don't think I thought it was normal in the sense that I thought everyone does this. You know, I think I knew it was different. Um, this is not the normal thing for anyone to do, I guess, let alone this man and me, uh, a child. So you, so you knew it wasn't right, that it wasn't, it wasn't. I don't, I don't know if that would be the word I would use. Uh, I knew it wasn't normal. Right. Um, but nothing, this is part of the thing. I think the psychology that was going on for me at the moment is that nothing that was happening in this weekend and this week was normal, right? Like here I was, this little boy from Australia with my idol in his home. He's telling me he loves me already. And, you know, we were meant to be together. God has brought us together. Um, so the whole thing was already so incredibly surreal and yeah. not normal, right? So normal had gone out the window days prior, right? And I was in what felt like another dimension. And, but already for me, for me you know, anything Michael said or did was, was right, right? Was gospel to me. Um, so yeah, I don't think I've, I didn't think it was wrong or not right, but I had a sense it wasn't normal. But whatever he did, whatever Michael did in his life in this moment was right to me, you know, because he was nothing but right. But then your parents were coming back to get you. So did he worry that you would tell them what had gone on or anything? Did he tell you anything about that? Yeah, I mean, that was pretty immediate um right after the abuse first began that was really kind of first order of business for him to start immediately telling me you know so listen if anybody else you know ever found out about anything that we're doing here um both of our lives will be over and we'll both go to jail for the rest of our lives, we'll be separated. We'll never be able to see each other again. Um, and you know, his reasoning for this was that people are ignorant, and people wouldn't understand that we love each other. And this is how one of the ways that we show our love. Um, so, but so that fear was was pretty quickly struck into me. Um, jail and being separated from him so you know that was a done deal for me at that point it's like okay well there's no way i want either of those things to happen ever so i'm never going to tell a soul as long as i live you know and that and that continued and you guys you ended up your family there's you and your mom ended up i think staying in in uh in California, correct? Or and, and the rest of the family went back at that point? Um, no, well, in that first trip that, yeah, there was a couple, I, I was with him alone at, at Neverland for about a week or so. We reconnected. Um, then I believe we stayed a couple more days with him. My mother and I, um, maybe my sister, I think just my mother and I 
um, in his, what was his like century city um, apartment at the time, while my dad and grandparents and maybe my sister kept sort of traveling a little bit through California. Um, and then that was sort of the end of that first trip. And we all went back to Australia. Oh, you're all um, good. Okay. And then over the next almost two years, um, my mother and I traveled back to Los Angeles several times um, to spend time with Michael. At his request, right? He was calling you and calling your mom. And... Yeah. I mean, once that, that first you know, week at Neverland happened, um, our, you know, my contact with Michael um, was constant. So even once we went back to Australia, you know, we would talk, he and I would talk on the phone for hours um, every day, if not almost every day um and sending faxes back and forth and so when we were in australia it was constant contact via phone call and faxes and that sort of thing sending drawings back and forth to each other and him sending me gifts in australia and all sorts of things and um and then those those several trips which would be like i don't know between two weeks to some were even like six weeks at a time with my mother and i visiting him at his request um and then you know, about uh, about two years later, uh, we moved uh, my mother, sister, and I to Los Angeles. Um, he sponsored us to come, and um, you know, moved for me for my career in the entertainment business, and also really to sort of live out what we thought was going to be this fantasy of kind of kind of living with him. You know, and so. Your sister, did you, so did the abuse go on in when your mom and your sister were around, or where were they when this was going on? Yeah. Um, so yeah, post that 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 first week at Neverland, um, you know, even at the end of that first trip when we went to his apartment in Century City, it was just, from then on, it was just kind of the standard that. You know, I would stay with him in his bedroom wherever we were, whether it was Neverland or his apartment or traveling somewhere. Um, I would stay with him in his in in his bedroom, and and my mother and or sister would stay in you know a, a, a bedroom, a guest bedroom, often you know very close next door. Um, and yeah, abuse would always be going on. And, and they just uh, whenever didn't I was question with him. that they didn't question it because. It was, it didn't, I know, you know, um, it you might know, be hard for people to think of that. Yeah, I know. You know. I mean, it was a different time too, but it was Michael Jackson. Is that why they didn't question it or, you know, yeah, as far as I know, and as far as what my mother tells me, um, you know, at that point, no, she never questioned that, that there was anything going on that it was that it was strange that i was you know staying with him in his bedroom um you know and this is what's obviously been really hard for me once i started speaking about the abuse and began my healing journey and started trying to unearth everything that was so compartmentalized with me while i was you know a new father at the time um, so beginning to have this experience and perspective of a parent. Um, but obviously my perspective as a young parent was coupled with my perspective as, as, as a survivor, right? As a victim of sexual abuse. So yes, this all became so confusing for me in relation to my mother. You know, how, how could you not think that was strange? How could you not question that? How, all, all of that. Um, but yeah. um, she was, uh, yeah, she was completely swept up in how kind and sweet and, and, and famous uh, Michael was. You know, was and you were in the public eye a bit too, weren't you? I mean, he was, he was taking you on travels at, at some point and you were photographed together quite a bit. Yeah. Was, was there a difference between the public presentations of the two of you or did you feel it was different being in public than behind i mean was he was he two different people 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, especially as as far as the way he would um, interact with me, you know, I mean, there was no way near the level of sort of, uh, you know, physical closeness and intimacy and touching and that sort of thing whenever we're, we were in public um, with anybody around or with the possibility of cameras around or that sort of thing. Um, or even with your mother and sister around. Yeah, I mean, obviously, as far as anything explicit, um, right. you know, um, but in front of my mother and sister, he definitely seemed to be comfortable with, you know, um, what seemed like the sort of paternal um, intimacy, you know, holding hands, hugging me, kissing me on the cheek, um, having his arm around me, having me sit on his lap. Um, all of that was sort of normalized in front of my mother and sister and that sort of thing. So I, I don't want to spend too much more time on, on this because I want to talk more about your healing process and, mm -hmm. and what, what, how that has gone. But were you aware that, that Michael had other sleepovers with other boys at the time or that you were going through this? And, and what did your thought process on that? Yeah. Um, you know, that started to, I, I wasn't aware of that at first. Um, and that was kind of a, a point that Michael really made to me right at the beginning, I think the beginning of the abuse starting um, his whole thing with me was that, you know, he would tell me that I've never done this. He'd never done this with anybody else um, that I was, you know, the first person he'd ever done anything like this with. And, and, you know, that also made me feel really special when I was seven, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, no. And then over the next two years of those visits um at certain times there would be other boys around um maybe like little parties or gatherings at at his place with multiple boys um and yeah i mean pretty quickly that started making me feel uncomfortable and and just jealous you know um just at that point just like oh no he's he's my friend he's my special friend and you know, he seems to uh, really love and enjoy these other boys as well. So that started to be, you know, make me feel really uncomfortable. And then especially once we moved to Los Angeles um, and yeah, there were, you know, several experiences of kind of like group sleepovers, whether it be at Neverland or at one of his apartments um, in Los Angeles uh, with multiple boys. Um, and by that point, the nature of Michael and I's relationship had changed a bit in the sense that all of a sudden I didn't feel like I was, I didn't definitely didn't feel like I was the only one and I didn't feel like I was number one, you know? Yeah. Um, so there would be times where now, you know, Michael would disappear into his bedroom or somewhere else with another boy and I'd be out there with the rest of the boys. And, you know, was it always one boy at a time that he would go in with or? Um, as far as I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's hard to tap in exactly the kind of level of awareness I had, but there was definitely a sense in me that like, I didn't want to admit it to myself really, but when he would disappear with another boy, you know, I had a sense of what was going on in there because usually before that i would be the one he would disappear with even if it was within a you know group scenario with a couple other boys um so i kind of didn't want to admit that to myself i didn't really want to think it but but deep down i knew what was probably happening in there the same sort of you know what i call abuse now um that was happening with me and that was uh you know it was really difficult it was really hard and so then i was felt like I was, um, you know, competing with these other boys and, you know, trying to sort of figure out, okay, what does he like about that boy? Is that boy funny? Is he, is he more rascal? Do I need to be more like that to try and, you know, for him to love me as much as he, as he used to again? Uh, so that became really difficult for me. And you met, you met James Safechuck too during that time, right? But yeah, you didn't I think really I, know each other, or, but you. Yeah, 
I think I first met him when I was maybe around nine or 10. It was on like a, a music video of Michael's jam music video that um, I danced in a little bit. And James was there with Michael and a, and a couple of other boys. And that was one of the first times we met. Um, and it's interesting in relation to the connection that James and I have now to look back that even in that first meeting, um, we spent a little bit of time together, but there was a, there was some kind of connection between us. Um, it just had some similarities and that we were both kind of, um, kind of soft spoken, a little gentle. Um, and in hindsight, now I know that even that first time we met, we were both kind of beginning to be a little bit more on the outskirts of our relationship with Michael. Like we didn't, we both didn't feel like we were sort of the number one anymore. Um, so I don't know, but there was some sort of, we were in a similar position, not knowing that we were. So we had some sort of connection. So you weren't jealous of each other. You were more like bonding over the fact that you both were. Yeah, there was nice. something, there was something different. Like with some of the other boys, there was more of a standoffish feeling and a jealousy sort of thing. And something about the connection with him, it didn't, there wasn't that tension. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it was a very short connection. We didn't spend a lot of time together. We met. Once again, years later with Michael, when we were kind of both teenagers, um, also had another strong sort of connection then. And then that was it until we were able to be brought back together through, you know, within the last 10 years. So let's talk about how the abuse stopped. When did it stop? What, what was the catalyst for it ending? Do you remember? Um. Well, the last, you know, the last abuse happening, I remember was when I was about 14. Um, and, you know, the, a lot of dynamics has changed. When I was 14, I was, you know, the same height as him or, or maybe even taller already at that point. So, you know, physically a very different dynamic. Um, I was, you know, very interested and involved with girls at that point in my life already. Um, so obviously it's complex and crazy from the beginning, but it was just kind of a, all these other layers of complexity now. And I remember that at that point, however subconsciously I was, I was, I was trying to get Michael and I's relationship to kind of, I don't know, move into some sort of new phase, like what I felt was like a more adult phase. Um, uh, I was trying to make a sort of different connection with him. I, I, I remember that last abuse experience and even before the, the abuse started happening, I was trying to play him some music that I was into and talk to him about some films that I was into. I was just trying to like connect with him at a new level and kind of get him to recognize the things that I was into. Because there was this, obviously this mentor-mentee relationship and I, maybe I was trying to sort of level the playing field to some degree, like, can we be peers at a subconscious yeah. level? Um, and I just remember he just wasn't that interested in what I was trying to share with him. Uh, it was kind of like, and then it was like, all right, let me just fall into line and let's do what we always do, uh, which, which was the abuse. Um, and, and that he was still, he, he was, he was okay with, he was still interested in that, even though you were 14. Yeah. And then why was that the last time, do you think? Did you stop? I mean, there was, so yeah, I don't know. There wasn't like um, uh, an obvious happening as far as realizing, okay, this is going to be it or him ever saying anything or, um, I don't know. It just, it, that was it. It, it. it stopped happening after that. And I think... I mean, I guess it's speculation, but um, yeah, I feel like I aged out, you yeah. know, like I was just starting to look like a man, you know, more towards being a man than a boy. Um, and uh, so maybe I just, you know, I wasn't attractive to him in that way anymore as far as I didn't look and feel like a little boy anymore, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. He never expressed anything to me about that or 
you know. You just stop calling or, or but, but you you have a professional relationship after this, right? Um did you or agree. I mean our professional relationship was 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 pretty minimal. Um but you know what had already started happening by that point, you know, our contact from let's say, you know, from nine years old when we moved to Los Angeles to 14 when that last abuse happened, you know, our contact, his contact with me was less and less. Um, so, you know, it gotten to the point at that point where we would, I would maybe see him, you know, maybe two times a year. Um, maybe we'd talk three or four times in a year uh, as opposed to, you know, what was every day or seeing each other every month or, you know, how much it had shifted in that sense. Um, so yeah, there's a lot less contact. I had really sort of, I was teaching dance. I had started choreographing like my sort of like career, what turned into sort of my adult career had really begun. I was a lot busier. Um, so our connection had just shifted and, and pulled apart uh, a good amount by that point. Um, so, so at that age, you kind of, you, you said you were in, you're starting to get into girls and, and um, was there any conflict between like, okay, I'm doing this with Michael, who's a man and, but I'm interested in girls and did that conflict you at all or. Yeah, definitely. You uh, definitely confused me. I, again, I think I tried to, I tried to not think about it. Um, I tried to bury that confusion as much as possible um but i remember moments like you know uh so you know i was heavily involved in dance and around dancers a ton and i remember um doing some uh, a show when i would have been i don't know maybe about 11 or 12 or something like that a dance show and you know tons of dancers backstage there's quick changes happening dancers are naked there's you know all kind of mayhem back there um and I remember there was a moment where a sort of a younger, wasn't young, it was sort of a young man, maybe he was 17 or 18 or something like that, dancer, um, was making some sort of quick change. And I don't know if he was naked or semi-naked. And I remember like he was just sort of running through, you know, the backstage area. And I remember just being confused and scared if like, if I look at him, am I going to like what I see? Like, am I going to find that attractive? I just, I didn't naturally, I didn't come up naturally, but it was just this, this, at that point it was a fear. Cause I just didn't understand what, you know, what does it mean that I obviously I had all these sexual experiences with Michael, but I knew I was attracted to girls and women and that was strong in me. Um, but it was just a, a confusion and a fear. Um, was I going to be attracted to other boys, other men? That never actually happened. I never actually felt that. There was just a fear and a confusion about that. Um, so yeah, there was definitely confusion and fear. So how did you deal with that? Did you just bury it, or, or did you? I, I I tried to bury it, and then, especially sort of from fourteen on uh, through my sort of teenage years, you know, I ended up being pretty like promiscuous sexually promiscuous with with women um and you know in hindsight it it feels to me like i was with that fear and that confusion like almost really trying to prove something to myself right um that that i wasn't gay or that i wasn't confused sexually that you know i was a you know whatever some bravado bs like i was a strong heterosexual man and i was really like trying to rack up sort of female conquests like a like a like a video game or something you know um yeah our last guest was dr lysak and i know you know him because he was a guest on your show as well and yeah. he said he said uh, a lot of victims of childhood sexual abuse either become hypersexual like you're describing or or non-sexual at all Right. Where they just completely don't have it. So yeah, it's, it's. I think it was definitely one of the ways I tried to yeah bury any confusion or fear, and also just bury what happened between Michael and I. You know, and that's the thing. Like I, you know, I never forgot any of it, um, but I just tried my best 
not to think about it. You know, do you think the abuse though affected your being able to have a not just sexual relationship, but intimate connection relationship with women that you you had met um, in any way? Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's definitely possible. I mean, even in the way that I was, you know, being sexually promiscuous with girls and and yes, not trying to get involved in any sort of relationship, it trying to keep it from actually beyond physically, trying to keep it from being intimate, vulnerable in any way, mm -hmm. shape, or form. And I definitely kind of kept all girls and all sexual relationships at, you know, an arm's length. Um, which I think, you know, to protect myself from that sort of intimacy. And yeah, I think that's one of the weird, one of the confusing, the many confusing aspects, again, as I mentioned earlier, was that, you know, Michael's approach with the abuse was so gentle and so intimate. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was violent. I understand that now, but it didn't feel violent in any way at the time and it felt like and the way he always talked about it was always about love and and there was it was really intimate there was always kissing and all of that sort of thing you know um so yeah i think there was definitely for me a moving away from intimacy in all ways so sexual relationships yes um and also just relationships of any kind just keeping people intimacy at a safe distance not letting people in you know including so my how, old, how old were you how old were you when the first um accusations came out against michael um i believe i was 11 uh what is the yeah the civil so we're still George going on with you at the time it was yeah. still happening yeah and, and do you remember what you thought about it or what your reaction to that was yeah, I mean, our first, my first learning of that happening was uh, police officers showing up at my door at our apartment in Los Angeles and wanting to talk to me. Um, and I just remember being terrified to police officers showing up. I thought, you know, I was in trouble in some kind of, for some kind of reason. They wanted to talk to me. And, you know, so they were the first ones to say, so listen, you know, Michael Jackson has been accused of sexually abusing a young boy. Um, and, you know, we just want to talk to you about your relationship with Michael. And so, yeah, I remember being terrified, but also really kind of shifting into gear pretty quickly. And what I mean by that is, you know, those talks that Michael started with me when I was seven, as far as like, you can never tell anybody and here's why, and here's what you say, and here's how you, and people will always want to take it. And all this training that he started to give me from really young of how people are going to try and lie to me and how adults will try and lie to me and manipulate me and tell me that it's safe. And you can tell me, and you can tell me like he started all that sort of training from really young. So I already felt like a soldier, you know, ready to deny any of this and to keep me, but to me, most importantly, to keep Michael safe. So as with that first happening of the police showing up, I kind of like really kicked into gear. It was like, all right, showtime. You know, like it's time for me to, to be strong and to <clears throat> deny everything, you know? Um, so yeah, you know, I did, I, 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 you know, as they started to ask me, did Michael ever touch you in inappropriate, all that stuff. Um, it was just, it was without, just no. without batting an eyelash, like just no, never, you know, that's disgusting. He would never do anything like that. And then a few years later, there was, was it a few years later that there was a trial? Uh, how old were you then? Well, yeah. So within that first experience, that was, you know, what started as a civil suit um i ended up testifying um as a part of that during that time i'm not i don't remember if it was for just the civil suit i think i think it was because they were starting a, they were trying to get a criminal investigation going uh the lapd um 
So for one of those entities, I, I did a testimony at that point, a deposition, um, like a private deposition when I was 11. Um, and then, you know, Michael settled that, that civil suit um, with the accuser for a large sum of money. And then the criminal investigation went away. They, I guess, didn't have enough to, didn't, to get it going. And then the actual criminal trial against Michael happened years later. Uh, I was, so I think it was 2005. I think I was 22, somewhere around there, which I ended up testifying, um, you know, grand jury and all of that then. And you still, you still denied that there were abuse then and you were still defending Michael. So you were still in that frame of mind, even at that age. Yeah. Um, it's, I remember it's trying, still a kid, you know, 22 is still a kid. But. Yeah. I remember trying to get out of it. Like I didn't, I didn't want to testify this time it was something there was definitely a difference there. Like when I was 11, I was just like kind of in that soldier mode and I was like, yes, I'll do it. I will defend Michael. He's my friend, you know? Um, and when this, this criminal trial was going on, I had met my wife, um, my now wife, Amanda, by that point, And I had just begun this whole new version of life with her. We were gearing up to get married and I was just really getting ready to just kind of start this, what I felt like this whole new version of life. And then this, here it was all again, and this criminal trial popped up and I was just like, oh, the last thing I wanted was to be a part of all that madness again with the way the media hounds you and all of that. Um, and, I, and I told Michael that. Uh, so you know that's the the, the through line. So he asked that. you to uh, he asked you to take the stand. Yeah. Um, okay. The well, that's the th the, the through line. I was going to say is that like you know as I mentioned, as our contact was you know dwindling over the years, but whenever one like when I was eleven and this the first accusations came up, all of a sudden you know his interest in me tripled. You know, and he was calling me every day again, um, and which again, when I was 11, felt really good to me because oh, I was like, Michael loves me again. Um, but all of our conversations were, you know, him training me at how to, how to deal with the police and how to deal with lawyers and how to answer all these questions. So that happened then. And then, you know, by the time I was 22, again, our contact was pretty minimal. Maybe we'd talk when we hardly ever saw each other. Maybe we'd talk once or maybe twice a year. Um, and then, but then when this criminal trial popped up again, there he was, you know, calling me every day again, but the same sort of thing, wanting to, you know, strategize uh, and train me on how to do it. But that's when I started to tell him, hey, I was trying to explain to him, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry. I just really don't want to be a part of this again. I don't want to go through all of this. I'm trying to start this whole new life with my wife and, and um, you know, he was definitely what felt like hurt and disappointed, but kind of tried to seem understanding. Um, but then as far as I remember, then I received a, a um, subpoena, right? To, uh, to testify. So then I kind of had no choice. Um, so yeah, at that point you asked was, you know, I still defended him. You know, I think there was the difference in my state of consciousness at that point being 22. Uh, you know, I don't think I, still believed that as michael told me that i would go to jail for the rest of my life if if anyone ever found out what happened between he and i i don't know if i still you know i under, maybe i understood to some degree that that may not be true um but i was still terrified by the idea of anybody everybody finding out what happened between us um, because I think there was still a deep part of me that, you know, felt complicit in what happened, you know, which Michael started teaching me right from the beginning. I mean, that was also one of the first things when I was seven, he would start telling me all the time, he would say, remember, this was all your idea. You know, like you, you wanted to do this. You started this, like this, the, the sexual interaction so he kind of which is a, a ridiculous obviously idea like how would i have any 
concept or desire of anything like that as a seven year old boy. Um, but you know, but he drilled it's, that into, it's me drilled into your brain. It's really... So I believe that still that, yeah. you know, um, so was I, was I a freak, you know, as far as when I was 22, when we were doing this, the, the criminal trial testimony, those were fears were deep in me. Um, was everyone, if everyone ever found out what happened, you know, I'm getting ready to get married. What would my wife think? So your wife, what would yeah, happen your wife to my, no, you should have uh, known. Nobody knew. Um, were you afraid of her knowing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. How did you um, think she would react if she knew? I don't know. I don't think I ever let myself think about it for that long. Um, but so, you know, these are sort of abstract feelings and thoughts in the, in the body and the mind, but I, I, it's just this fear of, yeah, would everybody, would she, would everybody think I was uh, a weirdo, a freak at some point? Uh, so, you know, because of what happened between Michael and I, and he told me it was my idea and shoot, maybe it was, I don't know, you know, um, at the time this is, and then, uh, and then still, so there was all those fears for me, for myself, mm -hmm. uh, for, for my relationships, for my career, what would happen to my career would, you know, would all that fall apart? Um, and there was still a deep part of me that wanted to, that wanted to save Michael, you know, wanted to take yeah. care of Michael, still feeling like, you know what, I could still be the one that saves him, you know? You know, I think what resonates with your story and Wade, it's, I know it's not easy to talk about all of this. It's, uh, and I really, so we're also appreciative. But whether it's Michael Jackson or somebody else that grooms us or, or that is abused, any of those two of us who are, are survivors on this call, it's, it's the same guilt, it's the same shame, and yeah. it's the same worry uh, that we've all had. And, and so that's why I think it's so wonderful that you do share your story, because it does, in a, in a very public way, with a very public figure, show us our own story, right? And help us overcome those same feelings of guilt and shame and, yeah. and victimization and things. And, and um, you know, I just really... Really appreciate it. In 2005, when, after the trial, um, do you think that anything changed with you? Um, was do you see that as the beginning of of having to come to terms with things, or did it still go for a number of years? Because when he died in 2009, you said. He said, Michael Jackson's unconditional love will live inside of me forever. And then six years later. I mean, just hearing he, that, just hearing you say that now, it's like, oh my gosh, I mean, his love couldn't have been more conditional. Right. So you were still in 2009, you were still under his spell. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you bring up 2005, did something begin to change in me then? Um, yeah, it's possible. I definitely wasn't aware of it consciously, but in hindsight, I think even just the point of how I didn't want to be involved, you know, I tried my best to not be involved. I didn't, I wasn't ready. I wasn't, I wasn't under his spell to the same degree, right? I was kind of starting this whole new adult life of my own and and with my relationship with Amanda, a whole new kind of spiritual journey had begun in my life. So there was definitely a, a, another layer, I think, of separation from him that had begun. Um, obviously, it was still relatively minimal because I did still want to save him and all of that sort of thing. But something had, yeah, some sort of shift had begun. Um, and Between then- 2005 and 2009 when he died, did you talk to him at all? Yeah, but- but rarely. I mean, again, I would say you know, once, once to twice a year. Um, I don't, I don't think, I don't, I think I saw him. Yeah, I definitely saw him a couple of times um, in that time period. Um, but a couple of times at the most. Uh, once with Amanda, with my wife um, and his kids. And, um, she still and didn't was, know. Amanda still didn't know. 
at this no. point. No. Yeah, and then 2009, when he died, um, I remember that being confusing at a whole nother level for me. One, At first, I just couldn't believe it. Um, there was something where Michael was never quite a human to me. Like, definitely just not a normal human. There was something alien, godlike, mystical to him always. So but it was such a human thing to die. And like that just kind of wasn't almost at an, at an abstract level, didn't believe Michael could ever die, you know? Um, so that was kind of a short circuit at first. And then the next confusing thing is that I figured I would be sort of overwhelmingly emotional about him dying. And, you know, I definitely had one or two big cries, but then majority of my experience i just felt kind of numb i felt confused and i felt numb um and that numbness towards the idea of him dying um really confused me as well um but then even with that so that quote yeah as soon as you died everyone was asking me you got to make a statement you got to make a statement i was running from that i didn't want to i kept trying to push everybody off of me and agents and managers and publicists were all saying you got to say something you got to say something um so that was hard for me to do. I didn't want to. So I remember kind of forcing that. Um, so I think I just kind of tried to just tap into like, all right, well, what, what, what were all the old what feelings should you say? for Michael? Yeah. What should I say? And, you know, um, but yeah, I, you know, I still didn't know anything, but yeah, I've always loved him and he's always been nothing but kind to me and helped me. And He's the reason I have a career. And those are all the kind of like go-to things that I just went back to and right from that, you know? So, so what happened? You had a nervous breakdown. Yeah. That, that finally caused you to break your silence. Um, mm -hmm. What happened between, what was the buildup to that? What was the catalyst for, for that? How did you, how did you see that coming or when you look back? You may not have seen it coming when you when you were experiencing it, but how did you? Yeah. When you look back, my son was born. Fun. You know, I mean, that's there was definitely multiple things, but that was the that was the whopper. That was the real sea change in my life, as it is for most people to some degree, right? Um, but you know, I think what happened is that there was this new being, my son, this new entity that had come into existence that I was truly responsible for. And, you know, maybe at some point he was going to be looking to me to data, you know, what's it all about? Like, what's life about? And so there was that. And then there was the way I was operating, which was, you know, Anything that comes up, fear, anxiety, anything, just bury it, push it down, go out and just push and drive and be successful at all costs. That's the remedy, you know? Um, and these two things couldn't coexist. Like I couldn't fake it anymore. Um, and something had to break to kind of shake up this whole illusion, delusion that I'd been living in. I mean, this is really a survival strategy, right? For 22 years. Um, so there was two nervous breakdowns. Um, the first one happened uh, when my son was around five months old. Um, the coinciding event that also played a role is that one of the biggest things from the beginning with Michael, as the abuse began, was also him, you know, prophesizing for me that I was going to be a film director bigger than Steven Spielberg. And that was kind of always his thing from the beginning with me. So that became my thing, right? And he kind of anointed me with that. So that was always, that's my destiny. So that was something I was trying to do career-wise for a long time, post, you know, from seven years old on. Um, at the time that my son was born, um, right at the same time, I got my first job to direct a Hollywood feature film. And it was happening. The prophecy was coming true. Um, and at first, you know, I was on cloud nine, new father, greatest experience I'd ever had, greatest job I'd ever had. And here it is, the prophecy is coming true. I'm fulfilling, 
my destiny that Michael set forth for me. Um, and then all these cracks started to happen. And I started to become sort of overwhelmed with stress and anxiety and stopped being able to sleep. Um, there was one morning sort of like 4 a.m. and I'd been up for, you know, six hours or so in bed, just falling apart, not able to sleep. And I remember Amanda turning to me. You know, she was terrified, didn't know what I was going through and turning to me and just saying, Wade, you know, what's going on? Are you okay? Um, and me just turning to her and saying, I'm unraveling. And so this first breakdown occurred. I fell apart, um, insomnia, extreme anxiety, extreme levels of fear, really almost inoperable, removed myself from the film, from all these creative projects. Um, and at that point, I thought it was just issues with my relationship with work and, and, and even with Michael, but Michael in relation to work, right? And he you know, told me things from the beginning of be the best or be nothing at all. So these, these mantras that I was sort of living from. So I went to the smallest amount of therapy I could, which was like cognitive behavioral therapy at that point, um, which is great. I think has its merits, but at least in my experience of it, didn't really go into the past at all. It was just kind of much more about now, what are you dealing with mentally now? Let's help you find some mental techniques to sort of push through it, right? And feel better. Um, so I definitely, with that therapist, kind of glossed over a, a you know, very clean, not true, not all true version of my past. You know, I didn't mention anything about the abuse or any of that sort of thing. And uh, got some mental techniques, stitched myself back up and got back to work. You know, the only kind of remedy I ever knew. But um, time was really up on that behavior for me. So within six months or so, all of my symptoms were back, a sort of extreme anxiety and fear and insomnia. Had to remove myself again from all these creative projects. But then, you know, I talk about this in the film, but I'll talk about it briefly. Um, what happened that had never happened before, what started to happen was that I started having these sort of flashes of the kind of things, the sexual abuse that went on between Michael and I. I started having flashes of that happening to my son. And, you know, extremely disturbing to have those. And my feelings towards that were so visceral and so strong with kind of rage and disgust and and vengeance, like if anybody ever did anything like that to my son, they would never breathe another breath. Um, so these feelings were so strong um, in relation to my son. Um, but then I would think about, well, that's you. I mean, that's what happened to you. That's what, and, and I still felt just completely numb. No feelings about the idea of what happened between Michael and I sexually. So for the first time I was like, that's probably a little weird. There's something, there's, there's, that's, there's something strange there that I feel so strongly about the idea of that happening to my son, but nothing about the idea that that happened to me. Um, so as I was broken down again and getting ready to try and start therapy again and trying to figure out what the hell was wrong with me, I figured, I was like, all right, if I'm, if I'm going to try and figure out what's wrong with me, I guess I got to throw everything on the table this time. And maybe for the first time in my life, I need to talk about what happened with Michael and I, what really happened. Um, but I was still so numb towards it and so compartmentalized that I honestly thought, you know, I'll, I'll go into a therapist, we'll, we'll talk about it, I'll tell them what actually happened sexually between Michael and I, we'll realize that that's not the problem, that that's fine, that's no problem. Uh, and then we'll move on to figuring out what's really wrong with me. Like I was still just so compartmentalized with it. Um, but uh, so I began with this new therapist and right from the beginning, this was in my mind, like, okay, you need to, you need to talk about the thing this time. Um, I was in still, you know, quite a sort of crisis state mentally, emotionally. Um, we were doing, you know, two to three hour sessions twice a week. And 
took me about three weeks or so to still kind of build up the courage to finally say it. Um, finally in a session about three weeks in, I think kind of towards the end of the session, it was kind of like a doorknob statement. It's like, oh, by the way, this happened. Um, and I remember saying it, you know, and I think I said something to the effect of, you know, we had been talking about Michael already, just my relationship with him, that I knew him, all of that, but nothing about the abuse. And I said, you know, Michael did molest me, you know. Um, and I just remember the therapists and my eyes just sort of locking. Um, but then kind of my nervous system sort of like formed rank again. I just remember kind of shutting down and then kind of zoning out and like kind of the, the rest of that first session is kind of a blur to me after I said it. But then, uh, I mean, anyway, there's tons of details, but that was, that was the beginning of what became this wicked, emotional, mental, physiological upheaval, you know, that was 22 years in the making, you know. And, and, and was that a nervous breakdown then at that point too, or was, was that? Yeah, I mean, I was already in it. That was the second one. I was, I was already okay. in it. I was already in the midst of it, you know. So how long did it take after you told your therapist for you to tell your wife? Like an hour. Um, and that was not planned. Um, extremely unexpected, but it was, yeah, I, we talked about this in the film, but briefly, um, we were already organized to meet up with my wife and my brother and sister right after this therapy session uh, for like a food truck Tuesdays thing. Um, just a little social gathering that was already organized. So I went right from what ended up being this, you know, sea change session where I spoke this thing for the first time. I was not planning on telling anybody else yet, at least I was not ready to do that. Um, but yeah, we were there at the food truck Tuesdays and my freaking brother comes out of nowhere and says, and my wife, Erica, you know, had this crazy dream last night that all you know all of the allegations like all of this stuff all of the sexual abuse allegations with michael that it was all true like and i you know normally right I, after wow. right after normally i would have jumped in and sort of made some sort of irreverent joke like that was a defense mechanism of mine for years um you know something like you know I don't know if it was true. I guess maybe I just wasn't, I wasn't sexually, I wasn't attractive enough. You know, why didn't he want me? Some kind of, you know, irreverent joke to just sort of diffuse. Um, but I, you know, everything was different now. I had just spoken this thing for the first time and I just kind of, I just kind of collapsed. My whole body dropped. Um, I didn't know what to do. I just couldn't believe that he just said that, you know, and I just looked up and said, it's true. And again, kind of became a bit of a blur, but what I remember physically is that his chest kind of puffed out and his reaction was kind of like, what? And, and it was just me and it was me and him and Amanda, my wife, um, at that moment. And I remember Amanda just caved in like a boulder, just hit her. In. Oof, takes me back. Um, like a boulder just hit her in the chest, you know? And uh, yeah, then I just began to try and talk about it with them. I went back to the table. My sister was there as well. I wasn't going to, I told her, I told Amanda and Shane, my brother at that moment that uh, I'm not ready to tell Chantel, my sister. She generally tend to be just kind of more of an emotional person. And I just kind of wasn't ready to take that on. Um, but I, it was like, there was no stopping it now sat down at the table and told her to, and, you know, tears just started streaming and we just, you know, I can't remember a lot of the details, but we started trying to talk about it and it's just confusion and sadness and anger. And I didn't know how to talk about it. They didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know what now, you know? Um, but yeah, that was the, that was the beginning. 
that was the beginning of the healing process too right yeah yeah and so at that point then you then you how did the how did the decision to have a lawsuit come about and um and the lawsuit kind of spurred leaving neverland which we'll talk about in a minute but why why the lawsuit yeah was that a way for you to come forward and write the yeah so at that point you know the 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 healing journey really began and my gosh this therapist uh dr larry shaw that i that i had in la the one that i first disclosed to um you know we just jumped deeply into this healing journey and i'm uh, just so thankful for this guy i mean i just think he saved my life um and 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 the techniques that he happened to be practicing um which are most notably, you know, EMDR, eye movement desensitization, reprocessing, and somatic experiencing, which long story short, they're just, they're both, you know, trauma approaches, approaches to healing trauma, but, you know, really focused on the body and you know, healing you trauma in the body. You about these on your podcast as well. Yeah. So I, I encourage people to listen to these because yeah. it's... And just sort of, you know, the intellect is obviously part of the experience, but it's really kind of about transcending just the intellectual memories or thoughts about and really tuning into where are where is the trauma where are the wounds in the body and finding creative imaginative ways to 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 unwind them so i was in that journey you know and what pretty quickly started coming up for me was what do i do with this like what do I do with all of this pain and this trauma and all of this happening? And what do I do with this healing? Like I'm starting to feel the healing occurring. Um, you know, I'll give you a short story that I think explains what turned into the, the, the lawsuit approach was that, um, yeah, we, I did a burning, right? So it was, I, I think it was, I think it was the, uh, I can't remember if it was Michael's birthday or the anniversary of his death, one of those two, once I had begun the healing journey and I wanted to do something ceremonial as this date was approaching, but I didn't know what it was. I ended up gathering a bunch of Michael stuff that I had around the house, um, personal artifacts, letters, things from him, and also like my costumes, like the costume I was wearing when I was five, when I first met him, I still had that all these kind of artifacts and just filled a garbage bag with them. And we ended up going to a beach in LA where they had um, fire pits and I wanted to burn this stuff. Um, so I was there with Amanda and our son at the beach and, and I filled this fire pit with all this stuff and this Michael stuff and lit it on fire and started speaking to Michael, uh, you know, Michael's spirit or whatever. Um, in this fire as this stuff burned. And I just started saying something to the effect of, you know, somehow, Michael, I'm going to turn your wrong into a right. I don't know how, but I'm going to find a way. Um, so that was this feeling that was coming up in me. What can I do with this? How can I help others in some kind of way? How, what's next to do with this? Where can I place all of this? Um, so I was trying to find ways to do that. Um, and had multiple thoughts and different ideas of things that maybe I could do. And what it came to was, you know, he's no, he's no longer alive. So, you know, I can't, I can't take him to court. He, he can't be held accountable in the physical sense. So what's next, you know, what's the next step from there? And, you know, the law, the courtroom is one of the places we have in this society to you know, try and move towards justice and for things to be taken seriously, right? And for, for people, companies, entities to be held accountable. Because um, as far as thinking about talking about this, it was like, I don't wanna just talk about it in a magazine or an interview, like it's just media again. What's, what's, what's a platform, a place where this could be maybe heard more and taken more seriously, you know? Um, so that was the feeling that maybe back in the courtroom. And it was also the courtroom experiences that I had when I was 11 and when I was 22 ended up being really traumatic for me moving forward in my life as far as, you know, having to um, tell the lie and keep the lie together, 
Um, so I thought, you know, maybe I could have an opportunity, like a, a do-over, right? Maybe I could get back in the witness stand, back in front of the jury, now that I'm able, now that I'm capable to tell the truth and have an opportunity to sort of reprocess that whole thing. Um, so that was the hope. That was the desire. Um, but the judge ruled that that the estate wasn't uh, couldn't be held accountable for the abuse. Is that how it went? Yeah. And... Um, yeah. I mean, it's been a you know a, technically it's still going. <laughs> like I mean, it's back. Oh, in it's the, still going. It, yeah. Well, it's still in, is back in the appeals process. Okay. <laughs> so it's been you know an over ten year journey. Um, and yeah, you know, on the basis of technicalities, nothing to do with you know anybody's guilt or guilty or not guilty or anything basis of kind of law technicalities yeah it was thrown out twice you know um but the director of leaving neverland saw you uh heard about this lawsuit and uh came to you about doing this documentary and um yeah. were you worried about doing it oh yeah i mean i definitely <sighs> was very uh, nervous about just the idea of media in any way, right? Uh, again, that was on the flip side, but my, my experiences with media throughout when I was younger through uh, the Michael allegations and me being in the place of trying to defend him um, and just all the ways how intense all of that treatment was. Um, so even though this was different now, now I was on the side of, the truth, there was still just kind of a built in sort of fear about media and can they be truthful? And um, who is this guy? I didn't know him at all. Dan Reed, the, the filmmaker. Um, but then it was the combination of, you know, doing a little research first and foremost, just about him and, and realizing, okay, you know, this guy's a legit quality filmmaker, journalist. Um, and then, you know, his dan's approach um he came at it from a pretty interestingly i don't know if i can say neutral but like i don't know pretty neutral perspective in the sense that he always said he's like listen i was never a fan or not a fan of michael jackson him growing up like it, michael jackson just wasn't a big part of his life of course he knew him and knew of him mm -hmm. but he just wasn't a big part of his life at all um and then Yes, like when stories of my court case had come up, he'd heard about it. And it's actually like someone else who brought it up to him. You know, what do you what do you think about this this Michael Jackson stuff? And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, the allegations and, you know, and never quite getting to the bottom of it. And and he was like, well, I don't know, let me look into it. And he kind of looked into it and and then found out about myself and James and our court case and thought it was pretty interesting. And and then he just came to us and said, listen, I just really think it would be interesting to give you guys an opportunity to just really completely fully tell your story. Um, and then we'll go from there and see what happens. And at that point, it was a relatively small thing. So HBO wasn't involved and it was just kind of NBC or I can't remember the name of the company, but a UK company. It was just going to be a small thing. And he had like a small amount of money to kind of like do a little experiment. He's like, listen, if you guys are open to it, let's do some interviews and go from there. So ended up just kind of taking a leap feeling like, okay, maybe this is an opportunity to now that I can tell the truth to really be able to tell it. And maybe it can be helpful to others. And that was really my hope that if another survivor um, can see this and you know, maybe it can help them, if I can do it, if we can do it, when the time is right for them, um, maybe it'll give them a little extra inspiration or courage to be able to tell their story. Or, or if, if not, just to feel less alone, if they resonate. How intense was it? How hard was it to do that? Because, I mean, you come through, like, it, it was pretty emotional, I got to yeah. say. For me, watching it, I can't imagine for you. You know, the interview process um, ended up being inc 
like some of the most intense therapy I'd ever been through. Um, like I knew, I, of course, knew it would be hard. I knew it would probably be emotional to a degree, but I had no idea. Um, the bulk of the interviews were done in one stint. It was like a three-day thing of like eight to 10 hours a day. Um, just, just myself, the filmmaker Dan Reed, and his assistant Marguerite in this dark room, just reliving me, reliving this whole thing. Um, but I tell you, one of the most powerful things Dan did that really helped me, I think, experience it at a whole new level was that early on in like our first day, early on once we begun the interview process, I think we were maybe only like an hour in or something like that. And we were sort of starting from the top of the story. And he stopped me and he said, he said, wait, it's, it's, it's so clear to me that you've done so much work on yourself, right? So much therapy and um, introspection and healing. And you've learned so much about the psychology, you know, of everything that happened to you. He said, but what I'm going to ask you to do is don't explain anything to me. Like, don't explain to me psychologically what happened. Um, I really want you to just tell me the story. He said, because I just, I don't feel like the story needs any explanation. I don't want it to feel like you're trying to explain yourself because you don't have to. Just tell the story as it happened, how you felt at the time, you know, without kind of stepping out of it and analyzing it, you know? And I think that had become, that was a survival tactic for me, right? That was even something I learned going through the court cases where I had to defend him was stay ahead of the person I'm talking to and really, really kind of plead my case, tell my story, which was a lie at the time, but I had to keep that lie together. So that kind of become a defense mechanism to kind of over explain, you know? Um, and so it took me a moment to sort of surrender to that. But then once I did, I ended up kind of really just re-experiencing. I was able to get present with the story and really just re-experience the story. And um, yeah, it was, well, it was incredibly it was, emotional for me. It was emotional for everybody. I mean, I mean, especially those watching it, especially survivors, but it was also very inspirational. And I really thank you for doing it. But what happened to you? What did you experience after that came out? It wasn't you know, all positive, right? No. Um, you know, even in going into it and in deciding to do it, because of what I had already dealt with so far since since be going public with the story of the abuse, um, like the media backlash and just backlash from people, from MJ fans and haters and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I'd already experienced a good amount of that before deciding to do this film. So going into the film, I was pretty sure that that's most of what was going to happen again. Like, you know, this is, if this comes out, like it's going to be really intense and people are going to be, a lot of people are going to be extremely angry. And, you know, a lot of people are just going to sort of uh, try and terrorize me, you know? Um, so I had that sense going in, but it felt like it was worth it again for that purpose, for me to have an opportunity to tell my story and, if it can help anybody else. So, um, yes, when it came out, um, you know, it was an incredible combination of responses. Um, I thought it was going to be just majority of backlash and there absolutely was that. And there was death threats, um, multiple and, you know, just horrible, horrible um, comments from people all over the world, right? Um, and, you know, none of that is easy. None of it's fun. Um, but I'd become normalized to that to a degree. You know, I expected it. Um, so I'd kind of built up a, a bit of an armor towards that. 
you know, when it comes towards me, it like it didn't affect me that much. The only when it when it was death threats against my family, you know, against my wife, against my son, you know, that was the stuff that was terrifying. And that was those are the only times that I would really question, did I make the right choice here? Yeah. Should I be doing this? Like, so I don't not that I don't care about me, but I'm not worried about me. But am I, you know, me doing this, am I putting my son, am I putting my my wife, my family at risk? And is that wrong? You know, is that right for me to do? Um, so that was tough. That was confusing. Um, what was more surprising and unexpected was the support that also came, you know, like that was the thing I wasn't expecting. And my, our first experience of that was when it premiered at Sundance. So it was before the film was released on HBO and there was going to be a screening in a movie theater. Um, and we were going to go to it, James and I, and there were threats to the theater. There was a bomb threat. There was all sorts of things there. So there's police oh. sweeping the whole theater before, you know, like 30, 40 police officers, like super intense security. So I remember before I went to that premiere, which we were in Utah, for Sundance um, in my hotel room before I left, I wrote a note to my wife and son in case I wasn't going to come back from that premiere. Like, I just didn't know. I mean, maybe it was irrational. But I was like, I don't know, someone going to stand up with a gun and shoot me? Like, maybe. Those are the kind of threats we were getting. Um, so I wrote a note just in case. I mean, that was the state I was in going into this premiere. Um, so we went and at the end of the film, the idea was that we were going to come up on stage and answer some questions. And again, I figured, oh gosh, here we go. Like we're going to get up on stage and, and there's going to be angry people and they're going to be all the same questions like, oh, come on. How come you never said anything until now? And you just want money and you know, all the same stuff. That's what I figured the questions we're going to be and the film ended and the whole audience stands up in applause and this was more disarming than anything like i didn't know how to process that i didn't understand what was happening we went up on stage and everyone there in the audience clapping for us and crying and this was the most confusing thing that could have happened for me at the time you know, and I just start crying because I didn't, I didn't know. This was so unexpected. I didn't know how to process this. And then I think there was like four or five questions, you know, that were asked. And every single one of them. And there was one was a lawyer. One was a dad and all these different figures. And like when the lawyer stood up, I was like, oh, here we go. You know, uh, was, the lawyer is going to drill me now. Um, and every single one of them was just nothing but just beautifully supportive and resonant. And I had never experienced in person, uh, aside from my family and close friends in the public stratosphere with this truth, I'd never experienced support like that and resonance. And so I remember after that, I went back to the hotel room. And as soon as I closed the door, I just crumbled in, 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 in tears. And, but it was it was just such a release, you know, um, to be supported. It was just the most incredible feeling in the world and to be resonated with, you know? Wow. You, <laughs> you just sort of, you know, you, you just, it's so touching and that you went through such an incredible courage, amount of courage just to come forward the first time and then to make the, the, the documentary and to continue your work. It's just, it's just, I'm so thankful. And I know that a lot of uh, survivors are, are so thankful as well. I want to talk a little bit about forgiveness. Um, we talk a lot, a lot about this as survivors, and you, I know you've talked about this on your podcast. And I always think it should be, you never talk about yourself on your podcast. So this is mm -hmm. this is a great opportunity, you know. And uh, I don't know how many interviews you've given since since the Oprah has uh, leaving Neverland, but I haven't uh, seen many. 
No. Oprah asked you if you had forgiven your mother, and you said not yet. Has that changed since the program came out? Yeah, it has. Um, maybe about four, f I don't know. Within the last five years, at some point, um, it started to come up for me, just this concept of forgiveness. And in a new way, and it started to feel like, okay, this is really the next phase for you, Wade, to really try and move into. And I tend to be an all or nothing kind of guy. So I was like, okay, forgiveness, let's do this, right? Roll up my sleeves and I'm going to do this forgiveness thing. Um, and so I really started focusing on that, started talking about it all the time in therapy and really trying to move towards forgiveness for, for Michael um, and my mother. And intellectually, I was feeling like I was ready. I, you know, had kind of gained all of these understandings, even in relation to my mother, like, you know, did she make mistakes? Absolutely. No questioning that. Um, you know, was it malicious? You know, no. Um, was she, you know, incredibly naive and um, in denial and intoxicated herself? Yeah. You know, um, so lots of levels of intellectual understanding had been found. So I felt like I was ready and I kept trying to make this leap towards forgiveness. And I just kind of kept hitting a wall. And, but I couldn't figure out what the wall was. I just can't quite jump over the precipice to really feeling it. Um, and ended up finding that, you know what? It's, it's me. I'm the wall. Like I haven't forgiven myself. And I can't give anybody what I don't have. Um, so the focus shifted to myself and what, what have I not forgiven myself for? Can I forgive myself for, for not being able to speak? Wow. Sorry. Two massive deers just came out of nowhere and just ran across the property. It's pretty beautiful. Wow. <laughs> um, I haven't figured my, you know, can I forgive myself for not being able to speak up sooner than I did? You know, thoughts like if, if I would have been able to speak up when I was younger, maybe that would have stopped him. Maybe it would have sent him to jail. Maybe it would have stopped him from abusing what I think was, you know, many other people post me, um, all that stuff. Um, so that became the next part of my journey is really just trying to slowly but surely move towards that forgiveness for myself. Um, and then in relation to my mother, um, so I kept trying to do it intellectually, you know, I kept trying to make that shift and it wasn't happening. Um, and then last summer I was at a meditation retreat and it's just sort of doing like an intensive, you know, you stack tons of hours of meditation. And the idea is to just kind of get into like deep stress release, unwind, deep, old, old stresses. Um, so I was on probably the fourth or fifth day. And at this point I'm meditating, you know, doing like six to seven meditations a day. And I ended up having this experience in the midst of a meditation that it was like I met my heart for the first time, um, both physiologically and spiritually. And started going through this abstract experience of all these experiences in my life, the abuse, everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, and realizing that, oh my gosh, it was, it was you, meaning my heart. Like all those times I thought I was alone, you know, that I was isolated and I had nobody. Like you, my heart, you were there the whole time and you were ticking away and you were doing your best to support me. And this was really emotional. I started crying. And then from there, out of nowhere, my mother came into my consciousness and it really wasn't linear. It really wasn't intellectual. It was like, it was like the tide coming in from the ocean and grabbing all of my resentment and confusion and anger 
and sadness toward my mother and just washing it away. Um, and it was just this feeling that was just kind of so simple and clear. And it was just this feeling was, I understand there's, I, I, I hold no more resentment or confusion or fear or anger towards you, mom. It's gone. It's done. Um, and then I saw her a couple of days later and, you know, I didn't know if that was going to sustain. I was like, okay, that was an amazing experience. And I felt it. We'll see how I do when I'm actually with her, you know? Um, and once we were together and I was continuing to meditate and that experience kept happening and it felt it had moved beyond the intellectual. It had moved beyond me needing to understand why and be able to explain it but just a physiological knowing that that pain that confusion that resentment was no longer needed and was gone and i went to her and i was able to express it. and i said mom i want to tell you something that's going on for me um i have no more confusion i have no more anger i have no more resentment towards you it's gone i know you did your absolute best and you love me and I love you and all is well between us. And tears started falling from my mother and we embraced and, and, and that's sustained. And so, you know, I'm not making a recommendation or a prescription, you know, for anybody else. Um, you know, I don't think there's any responsibility. I don't think there's any requirement for anybody to forgive anybody, especially for survivors, victims of abuse, to forgive their perpetrator or someone who was inadvertently involved, like my mother, in some kind of way. Um, it's just my journey. And there's been so much healing work that built up, you know, 10 years of concentrated healing work that built up to that moment for me you know um the last thing i'll say about it is that i remember my therapist in la who i disclosed to telling me early on he said talking about the healing journey and he said you know there's so much healing incremental healing that will occur along the way bit by bit by bit by bit and then there's going to be times where you feel these kind of glacial shifts right and kind of but all those bits when you think about a glacier melting right it can seem like all of a sudden out of nowhere this thing happened right um but how many changes in temperature and drips and drips and drips and shifts and shifts and shifts did it take to get to that moment of a massive collapse um so so many steps so many drips along the way and then that was a glacial shift in relation to my mother your, your podcast with James is uh, From Trauma to Triumph. Yeah. Do you feel you're at the place of triumph or do you feel that's, that's still a journey? Uh, yes, and uh, both. Um, you know, yes, I do definitely feel I'm at a place of triumph in the sense that um, so much deep healing has occurred uh, that I'm so grateful for. Um, there's no question that I feel... Uh, so much happier, so much healthier um, than I've ever felt in my life. Um, and the journey continues, you know, and the healing is infinite, just like anything. Like, you know, I think, I don't, I don't know if there's any final destination to it. Um, but I, now I, I used to see that as, kind of arduous like oh my gosh is this ever going to be over it feels like there's no end to this healing and absolutely it feels that way sometimes but now it feels like just when you think you can't feel any better <laughs> right just when you think you can't heal anymore um one level of healing one happening of healing opens the door to another portal to another universe of possible healing you know so now that feels exciting you know 
um, it's not always roses, right? Like I still, you know, get triggered at certain things and there's still pain and there's struggle and at, at times of the healing, absolutely. But overall, I have this knowingness that there's nothing but healing and progress and evolution occurring. And it's exciting that there's no end to the possibility for healing. You know? So what's next for you, Wade? What's, 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 what are your plans, either as a survivor or not a survivor, or being, moving on, or, or what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I, I, I continue to really uh, enjoy the opportunity to, to be in a place, whether as a survivor of, uh, of abuse and or just a human, um, to be able to connect with people and through my story, through my experience, through things I've learned along the way, and also just providing a safe space for conversation, for listening to others, um, to be of any benefit to others in their healing journey and their life journey. Um, so I have a life mentoring, like private practice where I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, a lot of them are survivors of abuse or, or trauma. Um, and that's just an incredible privilege. I, I just revel being able to be in that place to just provide any benefit to others. Again, it goes back to being at that fire, talking to Michael, somehow I'm going to turn this, you're wrong into a right. So I'm just constantly opening up and looking for ways to continue that opportunity. Um, so I really enjoy that teaching role. Um, I love writing. Um, so more writing for me and definitely in the form of books um, is definitely something I'm working on and, and I'm excited to do a lot of that. Um, and then just open to any way I can be of, of service, you know. Well, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, those of us who are your fellow survivors, I'll tell you, it's, um, I have, I have not been, um, gotten so emotional during conversation <laughs> as I have mm. today. And, um, it, it, but it's not emotions of sadness. It's actually emotions of happiness. Mm. And, and that's, that's a difference, right? It's, yeah. it's, um, even though it was tough to hear your story again, it's it's uh, the coming out of that and, and triumphing over that is yeah. is what's so inspirational. Mm. And um, I just can't thank you enough for sharing all of that today. Um, and I, I know that it was very early for you and I, I really appreciate it. And I hope you continue the podcast. I hope everybody listens. Uh, to From Trauma to Triumph. You can find it uh, in many, many places. Very easy to find. Uh, yeah. When I first heard about it, I think I was the first one on it. And uh, mm. it's it, it, it's just been an incredible reference and, and discussions about different ways of, of uh, healing yeah. and uh, your guests and your insights. And you, you're just incredibly well-spoken, I have to say. Oh, not, a, not a hint of Aussie accent either. I don't know where that went, but. <laughs> no, well, that was um, so young, right? When we left. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I hope that someday you'll come and do this again. Uh, we'll talk about other things because there's so many other things to get into, the types yeah. of, of uh, healing that you've gone through and things like that. So uh, thank you again for, um, for that. And go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. Yeah. Craig, thank you so much. I mean, it's. It's a beautiful way to start the day um, in, in, uh, in conversation, in vulnerability, right? In honesty. Uh, that's a practice I try to keep to keep pushing myself towards vulnerability. It's easy to shy away from that and, you know, try and protect yourself again. Um, and so I'm grateful to you, Craig, and I'm grateful to Voices Beyond Assault and, and, and the, the, the men's division, VBA. It's just really powerful what you guys are doing. Um, so, and thank you everyone thank you. for, for, for being here and, and listening and asking questions. I really appreciate it and wish everybody just at whatever, whatever your journey is, whatever your story is, um, just wish you continued healing 
because um, there really is, in my experience, there's just an infinite source of it out there. You know? One of my favorite things about doing this program has been meeting people like yourself. And, and I know we had two discussions prior to this program and I just uh, getting to know you has been an incredible experience and I really thank so you. appreciate it. And, and thank you all for joining us today. And um, we hope to see you May 6th and uh, Wade, I hope to have you back again sometime. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Have a good day, Craig and everybody. Thank you, everybody. Hands on my chin, I was lost and looking in the glass of time. Was it just a wine? Made me cry. I hope I'm satisfied. I saw myself an older man folding up his paper plans and hiding it in his hands. Made me say, Am I? Tomorrow, too late tomorrow. My face crashed down as I had a look around amongst the crowd. It wasn't really there, and I swear.